It's my pleasure now uh, to conduct a conversation with one of uh, New America's fellows, Shane Harris, uh, who is author of the book At War, uh, The Rise of the Military Internet Complex. Uh, so Shane, welcome. Thank you. Uh, Thanks and for having me. The, there, I strongly recommend the book. I wanted to start, let's start with some specifics. Mm -hmm. Let's start uh, with Iraq. Uh, and I wanted to ask you, how did the military's experience in Iraq, or maybe the military and the industry's experience in mm -hmm. Iraq, shape the way the military looks at the whole cyber field? So it was really formative. I talk about this in the book in the beginning. It's really the, sort of the first section of the book. Uh, in 2007, everyone is familiar with the troop surge that President Bush ordered up in Iraq, where we sent tens of thousands of more ground forces. But parallel to that was a massive intelligence gathering effort, a cyber effort, really, um, that I think many people I interviewed for the book believe was actually the linchpin that helped turn the tide of, of the surge. And what you saw there was the full sort of capabilities of the U.S. intelligence community, mainly through the NSA, being brought to bear to collect all electronic communications inside the nation of Iraq to effectively sit on its network, gather up cell phones, emails, text messages, for the purpose of locating physically insurgents and understanding how the insurgent and bomb-making networks were comprised. That information was processed, collected in practically real time. It was an unprecedented intelligence gathering effort on the field of battle and was handed off to the troops on the ground. So you created this cycle of sort of gathering information in the cyberspace and handing information off to people in the real world space. And it was a lethally efficient and effective mechanism that really, I think, showed the military going forward how you could pair up the capabilities of kinetic military activity with cyber activity to really uh, uh, great effect. So was this just a difference in degree from, I mean, we've always done that. Right? We've collected intelligence yep. and somebody says, here's where the enemy is, and that, that gets back uh, to the folks who are actually in charge of the kinetic operations. So you're translating information into action, into battle deaths. Is this, is this just more of the same, or is there something about the ability to do it at this scale that makes it a difference in kind, not a difference in degree. That's right. I mean, to some extent, it is an extension of that kind of, you know, battlefield intelligence. What we're really talking about here is, in fact, the scale. Uh, the system that was built was something called the Real-Time Regional Gateway, uh, which NSA ran, which is, we're really talking about a piece of infrastructure here that was capable of ingesting this information and processing in real time. There were other things that NSA was able to do that look a lot like uh, information operations that have, that have been conducted in warfare before. So sending fake text, or sending real text messages to insurgents, posing as people they knew and trying to lure them into traps where they could be captured or killed. So kind of techniques and and ideas that had been used on a much smaller scale, but when you ramp it up that way, and then you integrate, and you put literally the people who are mining and analyzing the data in the same centers in the same rooms as the ground forces and the special operations people who are going out and conducting these raids and these attacks and bringing back more information, it is the seamlessness of that cycle that really became formative for how the intelligence community is going to fight war, help fight wars. So would it, would it be fair to say that if you, if you combine the scale and the speed, then information itself becomes the weapon? I think that's right. And that is the, the powerful lesson for them in Iraq was that if you could provide that information in close to real time, it could, in fact, be sort of like a weapon in that way. David Petraeus has actually said publicly in documents that he credited this cycle with removing 4,000 insurgents from the battlefield. That's a pretty remarkable capability to be developed uh, uh, for really what was the first time there in Iraq. So I, I th I, I'm sure I know the answer to this question, but I have to ask you, did anyone ever raise a question about the rights of regular ordinary civilian Iraqis? Not in my reporting, no. I mean, and this is really, I mean, you're talking about sort of an occupation force here at this time. Um, you have to remember, too, that the, the infrastructure in that country that grew up, largely the cell phone infrastructure, sort of developed uh, uh, in an occupation setting, the first contracts that the U.S. government allowed to be let in Iraq were for cell phone coverage. And it was really the cell phone networks that became sort of a, a very fertile mine for that. But no, in all of my reporting on this, the subject of privacy of innocent Iraqis was just, it was not raised. So, and this, of course, this is where the difference in, in degree or in scale makes such a difference because 
traditionally, yes, you're in a conflict area, you have normal military intelligence, but they're not capable of monitoring the communications of everyone. So, and it's, it's more like a warrant situation. They're going after specific people. There's reason to be suspicious of those people. You're under war rules, not peacetime rules. But here, of course, the distinction between war and peace is blurred, uh, something we'll be talking about uh, in the next two days in the Future of War Conference. And you have the ability to gather everyone. So let me, let me put this forward. So that was Iraq. And that's, you know, it's over a decade ago. You don't have the cell phone penetration you have today, and you don't have all the other things we do on mobile. Now imagine something like Ukraine, where you have a tremendous cell phone penetration. You have, to go back to the last question, U.S. corporations presumably selling product to Ukrainian citizens. And suddenly, and you have a conflict situation where suddenly mass data mining is infringing the rights of those citizens and is affecting the way they see U.S. industry. Is the, is the military now thinking about it that way? Well, I think that they're going to think about it in the context of what is the operational requirement, right? So right now, you know, we don't have a heavy military intervention, obviously, uh, in Ukraine. Might we, if we decided to start providing non-lethal aid to Ukrainians, say, we're going to outfit you with better encryption or ways of trying to circumvent state surveillance? Because we know, in fact, that there has been a very heavy Russian penetration exactly. of the Ukrainian networks. Uh, we've seen uh, them manipulating websites and trying to spread disinformation. There, too, I mean, Russia is, you know, has had early experience experience in the Georgian conflict um, with offensive cyber actions. So I think probably if the military is, what they're looking at here is, you know, how is this being brought to bear by the Russians as a capability? And if we were to provide some kind of assistance to the Ukrainians, how would we start countering that? So, yeah, so thinking about, um Thinking about operational requirements, I can, I mean, I can well imagine that if you were sitting in the White House and you were trying to figure out what kind of assistance can we offer, uh, the whole debate about lethal and non-lethal and whether we should be arming Ukrainians at all, this is exactly where you might say, well, we can do this, sure. but, but... And could we help defend their networks uh, better? I right. mean, would, would, it, would a cyber defense... Uh, a sort of offer to the Ukrainians constitute non-lethal aid. I mean, I'd love to hear what a lawyer says to that, but sure, perhaps, why not? Why couldn't we bring some of our own surveillance capability to bear to help the Ukrainians understand how the Russians were compromising their systems? And to be clear, that may have already happened. But this is certainly a place where in this new domain and treating cyberspace as a battlefield, which is how the military sees it, where you could imagine that, that resource being tapped. Can you imagine the U.S. offering that kind of assistance? Let's move it from defensive to active. So now we're offering assistance that allows Ukrainian rebels to do what you just described, and not rebels, the Ukrainian government to do what you just described in Iraq. So the Ukrainian government is getting real-time information about who's in the field, and that's being transmitted uh, to targeters. At what point could Russia say, that's an act of war? The right, United so, States just yeah. committed an act of war against us. So here we start walking down the spectrum, right, <laughs> towards, you know, we're in the sort of the realm of intelligence gathering activities and espionage. And then the closer that you get to trying to cause some real world outcome, the more you're drifting towards what the military today would probably classify as cyber war. So if we're equipping the Ukrainians with spying technology, with surveillance technology, that may be one line that's not too far to cross. If you're equipping them with computer exploits that allow them to go back and try and cause disruption on systems in Moscow or knock out communication systems, yeah, I would imagine then the Russians would say you're essentially crossing a line here from providing some kind of intelligence support to something that looks more, again, the military term, kinetic. We, we will, this is a conversation that, that, that I mean, we, and, and any rules? To help us decide that? Well, right, it's very interesting. So there actually is a fair amount in the public literature that the military has put out. I wouldn't call it doctrinal, I wouldn't call them rules. But there are sort of areas where the military has basically said, we would consider this an act of war, or we would consider this an act of aggression, where we would recommend to the president you have the option of responding, not just in cyberspace, but militarily as well. So an attack on the national infrastructure that causes death, a power grid attack, attack on public utilities, disabling a key part of the financial system, something that undermines the sort of the national security framework. It has to be sort of high end, but these are also very low probability attacks. That would be something where the military would look at this and effectively say, that's an act of aggression that allows us to respond uh, in kind. Interestingly, with the, with the Sony hack uh, from the tribute to North Korea, 
Uh, you know, there was a question immediately right after that when the internet suddenly went down in North Korea and Admiral Rogers was asked about this, did the United States do that? And the president had promised a proportional response to the Sony, the Sony hack. Uh, the experts I talked to at that time said, well, if we did do it, and I think we probably did not do it, actually, that would have constituted a proportional response, perhaps, under the legal framework. That you hack into our company, you wipe out these computers, you threaten, this, uh, threaten us in this way, we take down your internet for a day. At least at first blush, that sort of presented some legal scholars I talked to uh, with a, yes, that looks like a proportional response, something we might actually order. That could be instructive for future events as well. So from where I sit as a foreign policy expert and the former uh, dean of a public policy school, this is the new, one of the new areas of scholarship, research, conceptualization. Th I mean, you heard uh, Admiral Rogers say, you, you know, deterrence, it, cyber deterrence is very immature. Well, this is what I grew up on in the Cold War, trying to figure out how we do nuclear deterrence, right? What is proportional to what? What do you threaten so that you have a credible threat? Because obviously if you say, we're gonna take out Moscow, if you, if you uh, do something very small, that's not credible. Uh, so th then figuring that out in the cyber domain where, where that's what we're talking about. What, what do you make public? What's a credible threat? What's a, but what's also a legal threat? What, a, what is a proportional response? And we're, we're very... Absolutely, and that's why I think the Sony event was so important in one respect is that this is the administration essentially making policy as we go here and saying that we're going to, first of all, identifying North Korea, the President of the United States standing up and saying who it was, that's never happened, the Director of the FBI doing it, revealing some amount of intelligence about why they think they did it, and then announcing there would be a proportional response at the time of our choosing, putting aside the, 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 the shutdown of the internet, however that happened, we levied more sanctions against North Korea. Now it's a pretty sanctioned country, you know, maybe we didn't do that much damage, but that is essentially making policy now. We're saying effectively, if you, intrude on the networks of a U.S. company, if you make threats in the way that North Korea did, we reserve the right to sanction you. We potentially reserve the right to knock your internet out. That's policy being made, they and that, there is a deterrent effect to that, I think. So I want to ask you about companies and the, the way they, they uh, in, mesh or don't uh, with the military, but I just have to follow up. You just said, as a throwaway, you don't think that was us taking down the Korean internet? <laughs> yeah, I, actually, I, I don't. North I mean, the, the Associated Press has reported that U.S. officials say that it's not. Um, some of my own reporting suggests that, that it wasn't us. Uh, and and, and you know, to honestly, you know, it raises the question of, well, why would we have done that? I mean, if we have the ability to shut off North Korea's internet, which from a technical standpoint is probably a fairly trivial exercise as compared to shutting down other countries' internet, there's really about two or three choke points. Um, why would we necessarily reveal that capability or sort of spend that bullet on this incident uh, when you know, the president coming up and condemning it uh, having a conversation, and then the sanctions might have just done the trick. But we said we were going to do something. We did, and then we sanctioned them. And then the White House was very coy about this. They're, I think they were deliberately coy to some degree. Uh, but, you know, just sources that I talk to now are sort of more on the side of, yes, we're not going to come out and say on the record we didn't do it, but no, we so were not Sony responsible do it? for this. So did Sony do it? Uh, who knows? Maybe North Korea, you know, accidentally tripped its own switch when they were, you know, trying to figure out how we got in. All right, I will. So let me let me come back to uh, to, to companies because you you your book is the rise of the military internet complex, right? Obviously, uh, taking off on the military industrial right. complex. But one of the things you show in your book is how much the military internet complex is a public-private complex, right. that, that companies are deeply involved, and this is, this is the flip side of the, of the tension that we're seeing between the NSA and tech companies. This is a situation of, of symbiosis. So I wanted, you to, I wanted to ask you, talk about the ways in which the military depends on companies. Yeah, so I think on a, on a very basic level when you're talking about cyberspace defense and offense, the military, the intelligence community operating in that space is almost entirely dependent on companies. Uh, you know, we talk about the fact that 85% of the network infrastructure in the United States is privately owned. Just from the standpoint of conducting authorized legal surveillance, the FBI, the NSA on a daily basis depend upon a legal framework 
that requires companies to give them information. There have been times in the past where companies, we, we, back in 2007, 2008, we were debating the reform of FISA. There was a moment there where the companies were wondering if they were going to try and resist even participating in government surveillance if they didn't have certain assurances. And people within the intelligence community freaked out over this. The idea that the companies would not simply just sit, you know, take the warrants and do what they were dutifully told, but that they would put up a fight and say, we're not going to share the information with you. We're not going to give you access. You see it happening today in the going dark arguments that Comey and Rogers and others are talking about. Mm -hmm. Just on a very, very intrinsic level, the, you need the access to the network infrastructure. Now, of course, the NSA is very adept at going out and getting that access when companies are not going to comply or when they don't want them to know about it. But just at that very basic level, when you're talking about operating in cyberspace, it is a private, public, I hesitate to use the word partnership because that implies some sort of camaraderie, uh, and it's often a very tense and tenuous relationship. So is it fair to say that actually when we're thinking about the cyber domain, that it's the companies and their networks that are the perimeter of our domain. In other words, if you try to, to analogize from the physical to the, to the virtual here, the physical, you know, you've got to define territory and the military can police that territory or surveil that territory or defend it uh, however they need to. But here, the territory itself is U.S. companies and their networks, is that? Yeah, I mean, it's almost more like if you're using a, you know, a body analogy, they are the circulatory system. They are completely embedded. I mean, you know, the military, again, talks about cyberspace as a domain of warfare after air, land, sea, and outer space. But those four domains, they can effectively control and patrol, right? We patrol our borders. The U.S. government controls the airspace. We have laws of the sea. Cyberspace, it's, 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 these are, this is a, a domain that is completely comprised of of equipment and entities that are not uh, uh, governed by a single entity um, that sort of are, are moving throughout. It is not sort of a singularly defined space. And this is actually why, you know, even the analogy of calling it a domain starts to sort of conceptually stretch our definitions and our understanding. And it certainly befuddles many of our legal understandings because yes. what it, it is a borderless entity. Uh, even talking about cyberspace, what is it? Is it a commons? Is it a utility? That's President Obama has <laughs> been talking lately that it is a utility. That suggests that you can regulate it. Yeah, so this, this uh, reminds me of my, when I was in government from 2009 to 2011, uh, I wasn't there as a lawyer, but of course my background is as a, a law professor, and at one point I got myself into this debate about what was a global commons. Because from the point of view of an international lawyer, and we're thinking about global rules, it's great to have the cyberspace be a global commons. It's like the oceans, right? And that means it isn't subject to national regulation, it's subject to international regulation, and there are lots of reasons for lots of purposes to want to think about cyberspace that way. On the other hand, <laughs> from the military point of view, that's the last thing you want to do. And to their point, wait a minute, it isn't really out there. It is, you know, there are, it's not like the oceans. They're actually physical yeah. servers and they're located in physical space. And let's not let our, you know, academic conceptualization get away from that uh, because we need to defend actual networks. And so that, you know, I, I can't remember what, um, compromise we, we reached, it was carefully lawyered, but that issue is a very big one from the point of view of how you think about this globally uh, and from the international regulation and how you think about uh, national armies. Yeah, and it also military. raises the question of if you were ever to form a treaty in cyberspace, how would you even go about doing that? I mean, these are sort of the fundamentals. You know, we, don't, we have assumptions about what cyberspace is. We don't have any great definitions. You know, and one of the things I found in reporting the book is that when you, when you bring up the idea of a treaty, of an arms treaty in cyberspace, let's call it with the military, it's the last thing they want as yep. well. Because how would you verify it? How would you actually make sure that anyone is abiding by the rules of that treaty? And why in a, in a domain in which the United States military is not necessarily the far and away front runner or superpower, why would you preemptively limit our capabilities? I mean, this, this, this was an insight into the extent to which I think people like Admiral Rogers and others really see cyberspace as a battlefield right now. Uh, and they're making calculations and decisions somewhat informed by recent historical experience, somewhat using Cold War analogies and others, but this is also very new territory and, you know, again, making up policy as we go here. So we've got three minutes, so I'm going to ask for maybe two questions. Any, there, over there in the back, is somebody have a mic? You may have to stand up and, oh, here comes the mic.
Thank you very much. My name is Benjamin Dean. I'm a fellow for cybersecurity at Columbia University. Um, we talk a lot about the Sony hack today, but as I was going through the 10Q report that Sony filed quarter three last year, they said their total losses from the hack were $15 million. There would be no lasting consequences. Uh, that's about 1% or a bit less of their annual turnover. I wonder, given how many billions of dollars we spend on cybersecurity, whether it makes economic sense to do so, given that the losses are so small, even in what has been historically quite a big hack? That's a great question. Um, I haven't seen the report, so I don't know how they're calculating loss, and are they sort of maybe hiding the football minimizing. a little bit and minimizing that. But you know, you, you, I'll use the example of JP Morgan. I mean, reportedly, JP Morgan was hacked last year, spends $250 million on network security. Well, what are they getting for it? Um, you know, it, it's, it's, I guess for Sony, the question is also reputationally. I mean, I think that there's, there's a question of monetary damage, but you know, this becomes an event in which the White House and the President of the United States come out and start lecturing your CEO about you know, not being proper defenders of the First Amendment. So I mean, in that respect, I think the monetary damages to Sony are sort of in, in one category uh, that maybe is not as significant as sort of the reputational ones. Um, but you're asking a great question. I mean, what is the sort of the cost-benefit analysis? And many companies, it seems to me, have concluded that they're not going to spend that much money on information security. I mean, I've been hearing this lately from people in the electrical sector, down at the level of managing f physical facilities where there is equipment that is connected to networks that can be hacked, and you talk to people managing those facilities, and they'll say, well, we only have so much money in our budget, and we have other things we have to protect, like we have to put fences up. We have physical security needs as well. So I mean, I think there are people for various reasons who are asking, is this really worth it? Hmm. Uh, there, last question. Here, here, and yep. Is there a mic coming? All right. I can hear you. If you, you yell, and I'll repeat the question. So, uh, many targeted Can you repeat the question? Yeah, so the question was, is the Talon manual, which was a, a manual developed, I guess about a year, year and a half ago, right, Harvey, which essentially it was a years-long effort by technologists and lawyers to try and understand whether or not effectively the law of armed conflict that we use to govern kinetic military action can apply in cyberspace. Uh, and I found it to be a pretty persuasive document. I mean, I'm not a lawyer, but I'm fairly familiar with law of armed conflict in, in other settings and in asymmetric settings. Um, and it certainly raised the question of, you know, well, why not? I mean, there certainly seems like there are some instances in which that would be true. And everything that we've heard from the US military tells us that they would use offensive cyber according to the law of armed conflict. So when the president stood up after the Sony intrusion and said there will be a proportional response, that is a legal terminology, right? He's saying essentially we are not going to go bomb Pyongyang because they you know, embarrass Sony and delay the launch of a movie. So I think that we, we are, even if we are not sort of on the books doing it that way, it seems to me that we're following it in practice and I thought the manual made a pretty persuasive case that that can work. And in general, just as lawyers, it's very hard to start with nothing, right? I mean, as we have developed law over centuries, we tend to start with something from one domain and try to adapt it, because otherwise, <laughs> you, you may never get anywhere. So we're, we're I just, we just got an extra minute. I think we're, we're now we're going up. So oh, we're, we're going, over. well, we're over time. <laughs> okay, so let me, just, let me, <laughs> well, I'll take it. Uh, I'd, let me just say one final thing on the Sony point that I think has not, gotten nearly enough attention. So there, there was the uh, economic cost. There was also, Amy Pascal essentially lost her job, yeah. right? I mean, she, what was exposed made it very, very hard for her to do her job. So it, to individualize this, there's the, you know, what's the cost of the company? But there's also, if you're the CEO or in the leadership, Either you're doing a tremendous amount of self-censoring, and I remember when I joined the government, you know, being told at some point, you know, you, you, you start making phone calls rather than, than uh, sending emails, uh, or 
you are, you're really thinking about this not just in terms of the cost of the company, but the cost to you and your leadership team uh, should things be exposed. And that, that's a different calculus, but it's probably very much on CEOs' minds. I think so. So uh, I urge you to buy the book, read the book. It's, uh, it's wonderfully readable. Uh, I, I can tell you in terms of, of weaving together what are very important and complex subjects with just terrific stories. And join me in thanking Shane Harris uh, for our conversation. Great. Thank you. Thanks.